everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to start with some thank yous. Um, first, I always have to mention my mentors, B.C. Silva and Peggy Cooper K. Fritz, who are no longer with us. But, um, I wouldn't be here without them. Um, I have to thank the Boston ICA, um, especially Ava Raspini, the curator. <laughs> Uh, Jill Medavov, um, the uh, curatorial assistant, Annie Kulagura, who was just absolutely amazing. I don't know where you are. Kate Herlihy. Um, and these are people who have worked with me for over three years, on, also on the Venice Biennial um, project. Um, Liv Biel, Colette Randall, Chris Wilton, Megan Jones, Allison Bookbinder, Megan Jones, Philippa Polskin, Nancy, Nancy Kalela Mutiti, who's the book designer, Katrina Foster, Allison Hatcher, Natalie Brescia, Don, John Duchette, Andy Gray, R.J. Lamura, Anthony Montiori, Shane Murray, Kali Orna, Quayshawn Owens. Um, these are the people, some of the people who literally put the work, the show together this week. Um, <laughs> Sam Rosenfeld, uh, Gabby Shaw, Bella Steele, Paul Schwenbeck, Jawash Tunistra, Toru Nakanishi, Savannah Nelson, Timo Betts, Megan Desjardins, Zachary Trepani, and Mark Trepani. <laughs> Monica Garza, Charlotte Wagner, Daniel Agulugatas. I know this is long, but it's also important to realize the hundreds of people that have helped. Um, a very special thank you to Edwin Acevedo and his cleaning crew. <laughs> Mike Chan, Jose Cortez, Gail Levitt, uh, Eliza Milkenbird, Kevin Corsett, Emily Bierce, Maragna. Agnew, Rihanna Graciani, Uli Francois, Emily Mogabero, Samantha Joyce, Jalen Ramos, Izzy Murray, Jordan Marshall, Alina Balsiero, Nicole Hernandez, Everett Miller, Sophie Miller, Rashim Muhammad, Yael Paso, William Stitwell, Chloe Spring Geese, and Samantha Wythen, um, and that um, includes all of the staff from the ICA. <clears throat> and finally, I have to thank my own studio, um, many of who are here tonight, Andres Monzon Aguirre, Tracy Lee, Sarah Wang, who has worked with me for over 12 years, Edward Salas, Jill Cohen Nunez, Anastasia Warren, Raina Robinson, who is the studio chef, Lizzie Chamel, Jin Sik Yu, Marco Barrera, Catherine Driscoll, Pierre Paolo Martriadana, who um, is the architect who uh, designed the facade um, in Venice and the pool for Last Garment. And um, finally, Rebecca Deeve, who runs my studio. <laughs> also, Emily Mello is here, who is helping me develop Simone Foundation, which will become the entity in the next few years. Um, and finally, my gallery and their staff, Jacqueline Tran, Alex Fang, and Matthew Marks.
Thank you, Simone. Um, and I just wanted to start by saying um, how incredible it is to experience this exhibition. Um, and you always talk about the reason that you really love sculpture is that you have the ability to collapse time. Mm. Um, and I think that this exhibition does that um, in quite a literal way. We're able to see your work over the past 20 years, um, which is really incredible. And I'm so honored to have had um, the just great fortune to work with you on many projects throughout all of these years. And so Simone and I have decided to talk about our collaborations together um, starting in 2008. Um, and, you know, when we saw the pavilion happen in Venice, I was just really struck by the fact that we can never go back to a time um, before the pavilion, before Simone's ideas became so ubiquitous and before um, the idea of black women's intellectual and creative labor um, was centered in the art world and, and I would say also um, in the world at large. And so I'm really thankful that we're in this time now and that you have brought so many of us with you. And, and we'll talk about um, so many of your collaborators, but it's just really an honor to be sitting here in this time and space um, in the new world that you've largely created with your, with your hands. So thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. We wanted to start, um, this is the first exhibition that I had the privilege of working with Simone on. It was a group exhibition at the Kitchen um, in New York City, and the show was called The Future's Disruption. Um, and I uh, was really lucky that when I went to Africana Studies program at NYU, the poet and theorist Kamau Brathwaite was there, um, and he was teaching, yes, <laughs> <laughs> he was teaching his course on magical realism. Uh, which completely shifted my perspective um, and my point of view. And I wanted to just quote Kamau's description of magical realism because this exhibition uh, was really looking at science fiction um, and it, in the way that Simone was working at the time, which you can see um, these watermelon casts um, in the chandelier and also the TV antennas that were um, placed onto them, it really, for me, this idea of a collapse of time and also the way that Kamau spoke about magical realism as also a collapse of time uh, really helped to frame my thinking. So he described magical realism as a legba or lemba or limbo experience, the sudden or apparently sudden discovery of threshold or water gate into what seems new because it is very ancient, where the real, since it has entered continuum, holding within its great wheel all the tenses, past, present, and future, no longer in so-called chronological, chronological tension, but like the computer with random access memory from all of any time compass. And it becomes magical because with this access of what I repeat is a kind of blindness, we find ourselves in a capacity of translimitness, erasure of expected boundaries into mineral or plant, or Zemai, or Iwa, or Angel, or other? So, um, was this also a new show? Oh my. So this is another work called Brooch. Um, and um, it includes some of the uh, forms you can see in the galleries upstairs, um, which uh, I made cast of plantain um, which, growing up in Chicago, uh, was the kind of strange food that we had in the house. Um, and so, um, record made sort of um, make me think of a very unique um, West Indian experience um, or reference. And um, these have been cast with porcelain that's pre-stained to represent skin color. Uh, for doll making. Um, but during my participation in this show, and it was very exciting to me, it was one of the first important shows I was included in in the US and uh, the beginning 
Um, I think of my work taking seriously um, and also um, given a context, I was very fortunate um, to work with Rashida so early on in my career and also to have my work introduced in this way. Um, I would describe the work at this point as being very informed by surrealism. Um, and I think maybe we should move on to next. Okay. This was also in the futurist description. Um, <laughs> Do you want to talk about it? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I've made several works um, that uh, have uh, Uhura as subject. Um, my, in this particular work, um, in the Futures Disruption show, uh, I basically took a um, 34 length episode of Star Trek and removed all the text or movement and only included Uhura, who was who I was waiting for. Um, and, you know, I was just carrying the memory with me of having to fight over who got to be Uhura when we played. And <laughs> it was a conundrum because she always said the same line. So that's what happened in this piece was this constant repetitive of the same line. And the next exhibition that I worked with Simone with was actually the solo exhibition, You Don't Know Where Her Mouth Has Been, <laughs> in the kitchen. I see Robin. Um, and this was in 2012. Um, and I always, we always laugh to say that my daughter was a co-curator because she was this big <laughs> and in the carrier. Um, but this was a really incredible exhibition to work with Simone on because she was able to show so many bodies of work in one space. Um, and the kitchen was a particularly, I think, rich environment just because of its history of you know showing early video and experimental artists, but also the fact that this particular gallery had been a black box theater at one moment in the history. And so we were able to um, use theater lighting and you can sort of see the, the work Kool-Aid in the back um, where Simone was referencing Afro Cobra. Um, and you know they famously use very bright colors the Afro Cobra Collective, and so we were able to use theater lighting um, as part of the work. And you know, it was really Simone was um, so creative with this exhibition, and you know, you can also see the return of Sharifa Rose Pitts as Uhura um, in the space as well. And I'll just go to the next slide where you can see. Um, and Simone, you can also talk about this. Um, so this is the first appearance of um, these watermelon, um, which were cast as kind of breast-like forms in the um, truffle axis piece in the background um, with uh, kind of a festooned with antenna. Um, and that's out of that same mold of a watermelon, um, I cast these uh, porcelain um, objects uh, that were carved to resemble cowries. Um, and so also sort of um, continuing to use tropes of surrealism and playing with scale. Um, and also in the case of satellite, something I think has also been a through line in my work, I um, am not I'm very not, not religious, although I come from a very religious background. Um, but I do think that um, I believe in uh, ancestor worship as praxis. And so I should say one more thing about that with the, can we go back? Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things that was important in my um, study of African art is that I feel like in the West we really understand a mask as something that you would um, uh, use to transform yourself and become some kind of other personality. I think of it more um, in the West African sense or in also in some cultures in South Africa where a mass is actually something that allows you to communicate with ancestors. It's like a telephone more than um, a countenance. 
And I just have a funny story to tell about the watermelon cast because <laughs> when Simone and I went to Senegal with BC Silva for the ASICO program, she was giving a talk and she started talking about this work and she said, you know, because the watermelon is connected to all of these stereotypes um, and people were outraged. Like everyone <laughs> that was sitting there primarily, um, you know, folks from all over Africa that were doing the program with BC, they were like, why? That makes no sense. Why is the watermelon? <laughs> it's, you know, and we were trying to explain it, and we just could not. It was, it was, it was such an <laughs> incredible moment of, um, you know. Well, you uh, know, as someone who works with sculpture, I really, um, in a kind of bizarre way, enjoy the trope of the watermelon because. Um, especially at the time of Obama, people would create images of Obama and just put a watermelon next to him. And the fact that you could create this powerful insult by not just relating someone to an object, for me, is very interesting from the point of view of someone who makes sculpture. So. And my mother told me that her mother, who was from Charlottesville, Virginia, wouldn't let them eat watermelon outside in Harlem which yeah. was like shocking, to, and yeah. she's still upset about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next project we wanted to talk about is the Free People's Medical Clinic, uh, which Simone created in 2014, and this was a project that I was hired as a guest curator by Creative Time, and we ended up uh, collaborating with Weeksville Heritage Center to make a show really about in a very general sense, race and space in the city. But we really started to think about Weeksville and the kind of, and Weeksville was an intentional free black community started in 1837 by a group of black investors. And um, we started to look at the history of Weeksville and what it meant to have a self-determined community. Um, and this was while slavery was still happening in New Jersey. Um, and it's in central Brooklyn, right between uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant and um, Crown Heights. And Weeksville had the first black woman doctor um, in New York State, Dr. Susan Smith McKinney Stewart, and she practiced naturopathic medicine and allopathic medicine. Um, and they also were starting a research project with the United Order of Tents. And Simone really um, became interested in these particular histories um, and then also we were made aware of this mansion called the Stuyvesant Mansion, which was the home of Dr. Josephine English, who delivered, she was the first um, licensed OBGYN in Brooklyn, um, and she delivered all of Betty Shabazz and Malcolm X's daughters. Um, and this home is still owned by her family and it's used for community purposes um, in Simone built the clinic in this space. And I'll stop there. And this is an image of Peggy Cooper Kayfritz approaching um, the Free People's Medical Clinic. So this is my first social practice work. Um, and at this point, I have resisted uh, doing anything but making sculpture. Um, but Rashida convinced me to give it a try. Um, and so imagining. Um, how I could um, think about the same ideas and performance, I thought, to focus on black nurses. And this also was the first time that I met the tents and started a relationship with the United Order of Tents. Also, this is the first time um, I started to bring um, some of my other relationships um, with scholars and theorists and directly into the work um, because so many things happen behind doors at the Free People's Medical Clinic. Um, we had, I created a waiting room so there could be like a satisfactory, you know, so people could, could, where we could have spectatorship. Um, and, and we created a waiting room magazine where um, Nora Delson, uh, Robin Cost Lewis, who's right over there, and um, several other scholars contributed. Uh, Nancy Colello Mutiti designed um, the magazine. Um, and the, the Free People's Medical Cl 
clinic was um, a project, a series of projects that were created across the United States by the Black Panthers um, to directly address the lack of, you know, the medical deserts in various communities and also the food deserts and um, is largely credited for the creation of free breakfast for children that are happening across the United States in public schools. Um, so these are some images from the clinic. Um, over 200 women got pap smears at this clinic during the month that we um, were installed there. Um, we had classes um, called Afrocentering um, that, and a Dunham inspired class. If you don't have the specific, specific training, you cannot call it a Dunham class. So that's why you call it Dunham inspired. That was led by um, Amy Meredith Cox, who's um, a professor at Yale of um, Gender and African American Studies, and also a former Alvin Ailey dancer. Um, we had um, the most important thing of what I'm saying, I'm not gonna be able to list all the participants, but the important thing is that these are people who are already working in the Brooklyn community. These weren't people that I brought in from anywhere else. It was really more um, revealing and a display of the work that was already going on. And Simone was really also committed to this idea of continuity of care so that if the clinic was similarly looking at, you know, a lack of health care in that particular neighborhood, which we found to be true because initially we wanted to collaborate with some local hospitals, uh, which was very difficult. Uh, but one of the things we also learned was that because of the legal restrictions, doctors could not operate in, um, you know, just more informal spaces. And so all of the practitioners were, you know, there were midwives that were doing, midwives and doulas that were doing the well women care, um, and then just practitioners who are doing acupuncture, massage, et cetera, and the classes that Simone described, which, you know, they are the ones who actually have the autonomy um, at this stage, just, you know, historically and also um, legally. So it was um, a pretty real representation of what people could access themselves within Brooklyn, even after we would close the clinic. Um, and we also have, this is an image of Amy's class, and you can see Simone <laughs> in the class. Um, and if we could please show the video, Danny. And I was like, the more we're in touch with ourselves, the more we already know what it is to heal us, what it takes to heal us. I grew up in uh, Guyana, and one of my favorite things was to like listen to my grandmother's stories. And so folk stories have such a role in healing. Um, and remember that medicine wasn't always <coughs> written down for us, right? A lot of times medicine, especially in African-American communities or indigenous African-American communities, medicine was sung, right? We weren't allowed to write and read, so we sang to each other what medicine did. Um, and that's how medicine was passed on. The songs themselves are medicine, as is the herb that was sung about. And so a lot of this work takes in those folk stories and those singing and remembering what it is to be in touch with self. <laughs>
Yeah, then I turn to look, I see they snatched the sun from all around you. Cause you hardly seem to want what Um, I should say that um, that is uh, Seize the Time is an anthem written by Elaine Brown um, for the Black Panthers, um, who was a Black Panther leader. Um, but I like it because her music sounds like Bay Area lesbian. I always like that. <laughs> it's like so great. Um, and that also, was Karen Rose, right? In and that the was Karen Rose in the beginning. And also, um, my barbarian Malik Gaines and Alex Sagad made an appearance. Um, and also, the footage was shot by Madeline Hunt Ehrlich. Um, and Madeline Hunt Ehrlich and I created the film Conspiracy that's shown upstairs and was shown in the pavilion. This work, uh, so in 2016, November 2016, S Simone had a uh, residency actually at the Tate um, Modern. And for one week, she invited different collaborators um, to a project which she called Psychic Friends Network. Um, <laughs> and this performance was the final day of the week um, and it was called Aluminum. And, um, what was so special about this performance, we, we actually sang um, and danced our ways from the, the tanks um, all the way up. Um, and it, this was 2016, so you know this was sort of another intense moment of witnessing um, state-sanctioned violence. And we worked with Black Lives Matter UK, who gave us a list of names, which we sang as part of the performance. And those names included people who had died many times in police custody, so there was no uh, video or evidence, um, evidence of you know, their, their murder. Um, and what I felt as the person singing the names um, was that you know, unlike um, the names that we have here in the United States, they were not known. And so there was a, for me, there was a lot of heaviness in singing and saying those names um, out loud. But the other piece of this performance was really this desperation of Simone and I, and Simone talked about communicating with the ancestors. Um, she gifted me these anklets, which are Zulu anklets, and they're made out of foam and the tops of um, uh, cans. And so they sound like a shake array. Um, it's, they sound like bells, and I wore them, and that was another way of um, signaling to the ancestors as we moved through this space and called these names. And we also included the names of people like Stuart Hall, uh, Equiano, people who also had important um, roles to play in, in especially the black British context. And as you can see, we moved through the architecture of the Tate. The other thing that was really interesting to me is that this dress, which um, Simone designed, she also put iron oxide on it. So I was dragging a little bit of orange with me <laughs> onto the new floors, which felt appropriate given <laughs> what we were doing. And this is just a clip that um, Thelma had on her Instagram. So I'll just play so you can hear the sound and see the dancing. 
Um, uh, so the new museum um, was actually the second time that I convened um, black women artists for Black Lives Matter. Um, the first convening was at the new museum where I tried to revisit the idea of the Free People's Medical Clinic in a museum setting. Um, I found it very compromised and at this point, especially after the creation of Black Women Artists for Black Lives Matter, which became, um, and this is um, an image from the event, um, uh, artist uh, Fatima with her grandmother, who was also an artist. Um, during the day, we did a museum takeover. I'm really grateful to the new museum for allowing this takeover. Um, this was a, at the height of Black Lives Matter summer. Um, and we felt like we needed to do something. And when I put out a call, so many people came. Emily Mello is here, who's the curator of that project. Um, and it was a lot of hard work. Um, I was able to um, gain access to the museum um, by um, really discussing the precedent of ACT UP where the new museum had collaborated early in its um, creation. And so using that precedent, we asked for another opportunity um, to address the state of affairs. So we had a performance event um, that included um, taking over the fourth floor, the seventh floor, um, the screening room, the lobby, and the facade of new museum for one day. Um, and we raised, I think, $4,000 for Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. um, and established a, a community that didn't last for a long time, but I think um, a lot of work was done by the formation of this community. And I also realized that I just wasn't comfortable in uh, social practice, social scuffles works, because they were so out of my control. Um, and so since this time, I haven't really, well, actually, um, I started to work again in social practice with the um, creation of Loophole of Retreat Guggenheim. What I'll say. And that's Sahara. Yeah, that's now. my daughter. She's <laughs> going to be 12 in two weeks. Oh. Oh. Which it, she was so cute because the next day <laughs> there was a song that someone created that said, I am my sister's keeper. And she was singing it like nonstop. Yeah. And I was so thankful because, of course, there was a lot of also pain, right, it, on this day that was expressed. And I feel like what she held on to was this idea of being my sister's keeper, which was really evident, I think, you know, and Simone is really humble, but there were over 100 women in this group. Um, who organized themselves around ephemera, performance, um, film. And so it was really, I think, a really um, brave social sculpture um, that was very inclusive and allowed authorship to all of the women that were there. Um, so it was really incredible. And, you know, it started here, but we had a meeting in London as well. And then there was a meeting in Los Angeles, um, and there also was a performance, um, or they took over all the houses at Project Row Houses. So this this project went on in for Houston. In Houston, yeah, yeah about a year, on. year and a half, and I, and I was completely exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here we have the reappearance of Trophylaxis at um, the new museum um, shortly after in a show called Trigger Gender as a Tool and a Weapon. Um, with uh, the, This is the opening performance 
um, that I was really happy to try because the whole point of this performance was um, play and experimentation um, and not having really an idea what might happen. Um, and this is the first time I use um, one of these large um, kind of architectural scale uh, works um, as an actual dwelling. Rashida's um, entire performance happened from inside the hut. Yes. Um, and Sharifa Rose Pitts was outside the hut. <laughs> And I was saying to Simone that it was incredible to me because, you know, you can see in the exhibition here the way that Simone combines architecture and the body. Um, and this was one where, you know, we were actually inside. Samora Penderhughes and myself were inside playing and singing. We could see Sharifa's face. So there was a little bit of a call and response with Sharifa. Um, and the audience could see Sharifa's hips in her body. Um, and Simone and Cecily, my sister, also were singing. They walked around um, the hut. So it was extremely fun, but also I feel like it was a bit of a, um, you know, it was a way for us to both be the architecture, be inside the architecture. And I thought a lot about the kitchen house that Simone made with the Studio Museum and Marcus Garvey Park, which was completely closed. Um, and you know, you were left thinking about what was inside. It was if someone had locked up the house and walked away. And so being inside of this hut was also extremely um, rich, you know, because the sort of like invisibility of it was completely freeing, but then also um, that there was a call and response with Sharifa, you know, the vibration we could feel um, that we were like pushing um, the performance from the inside. And I feel like there's a sort of, um, yeah, it's just, it's just interesting to think about the functionality of architecture um, and how it, it shows up in Simone's work and to be inside of it was just such a special thing. Oh, and this is another separate hut where there was a video of me dancing and some more playing. Mm -hmm. um, inside at the Hammer. At the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles. <coughs> um, so... <laughs> um, so we skipped over showing images um, from Loophole of Retreat Guggenheim, um, and Loophole of Retreat was also the title of my show at the Guggenheim, which was uh, a part of the Hugo Boss Prize. Um, and at the Berlin Biennial, and at a couple other conferences, I had met Sadia Hartman and Tia Camp, and um, we um, organized this. Uh, I, at this point, I decided I was going to give it another go with such a sculpture, <laughs> and, um, and this time do something that was more uh, focused on uh, the intellectual labor of black women um, and to like uh, give a lot more visibility to feminist theorists, um, which I felt like we were getting into the third and fourth generation of discourse and it was somehow not reaching the larger public, especially the art public, where everyone would be talking about Foucault, but they wouldn't be talking about Hortense Spillers, but they wouldn't be talking about Sadia Hartman. Um, and uh, it was starting to get really annoying and also get kind of bizarre when you're like um, having such, such long and uh, elaborate conversations that uh, and kind of by yourself and with, you know, in this, in this community. Um, so uh, we did have a loophole of retreat um, at the Guggenheim, which was really successful. Um, and so um, I was really encouraged to um, bring a similar event to Venice. Um, and there was really no question who was going to curate it. So that's why I asked um, Rashida 
uh, to organize it and to do both the conceptual work as well as the uh, curatorial work because I was much too busy to be involved. Um, and in some ways, Sadia and Tina helped advise, but um, this was actually Rashida's project. Thank you. <laughs> It was such an incredible honor to organize Loophole of Retreat Venice, and I keep saying to Simone, thank you for trusting me, um, because she really trusted me implicitly um, to come up with the process by which we would, you know, invite um, participants, and we invited filmmakers and poets and, you know, theorists, as well as performers, um, and we really thought about the importance of having a transnational gathering and thinking about the precedence of something like Festac 77. Um, and you know, it was really important that we had women coming from the Caribbean, from the US and Canada, from throughout Europe, and also you know, from Africa. Um, and what was so incredible, I think, happening in, in the real space was just um, one, Simone's invitation, which the initial invitation at the Guggenheim was called Carte Blanche. And that was a sort of informal title um, for the loophole of retreat. And I think um, we kind of adapted that same principle. Um, but we thought, you know, and Tina Camp had come up with keywords for the first loophole of retreat, which Simone was very opposed to the idea of keywords. And still am. <laughs> she still is. <laughs> and so for this one, you know, we like we were like, oh, maybe we shouldn't do it, but then we couldn't help ourselves. Um, and so we had five sort of directives, which we said to people, these are completely, uh, you're welcome to ignore them, or you're welcome to use them if they are useful to you. Um, and those directives were marunage, um, and thinking about, you know, Deborah Anzinger's work, the artist who actually participated in Lupola of Retreat, who's based in the Cockpit country in Jamaica, um, which is a historical site of the Maroons. Um, we talked about Manual, also inspired by the relationship between Sadia Hartman and Simone. And Sadia has an essay in her latest book <coughs> called The Manual for General Housework, uh, which talks about you know, all the various ways that you can think about the manual, manual labor, and the use of the hand. Um, and then we talked about medicine. Uh, medicine was another um, directive which you know, was inspired by Simone's work with the Free, People Medi Free People's Medical Clinic, but also thinking about root doctors and you know, all of the various ways that we use medicine um, to really uh, be okay, you know, emotionally, spiritually, intellectually physically. Um, and then we also talked about magical realism, which I you know, referenced Kamal Brathwaite. Um, and there were actually some of his students um, were also participating. Um, so it was you know, just really incredible to see the way that his work continues to, to live. Um, and then Sovereignty, which was the title of the pavilion, um, Simone's Pavilion exhibition, and really just thinking about one of the important tenets of Simone's work, the authorship and agency of the individual black woman, um, but also her insistence on the collective. And so for me, uh, Loophole of Retreat was really, I think, you know, she described it as a social sculpture. And, and for me, I really think of it as um, a way to live out the values that I've seen Simone um, live and that we've lived together um, over many years. And you know, Simone has always had dinner parties at her house. Some of you have been to them. Um, and like when BC Silva would be in town, there was a dinner party. Um, you know, I met so many, um, uh, you know, just black women from all over the world in Simone's living room. And so I think that loophole of retreat is a way of, you know, putting that in the world and also, as we spoke about really making sure that black women's creative and intellectual labor is given the proper platform. Because as we know, um, you know, many times we are referenced without name. Um, you know, people don't cite their sources and it's a way to make sure that this work is documented, that um, people's voices are um, archived and we're, we're gonna create a book as well 
um, for Lupola for Treat, which is really exciting. Um, yeah, and I'll show a few other images. Um, the other thing that was really important and that Simone gave me um, just the full agency to do was to have a big focus on performance. Um, and so we were able to convert a pool um, on the grounds of the Cheney Foundation, which is where Lupo's retreat happened, um, into a black box theater. And so this is autumn night. Um, we also had, um, this is Ayana Evans' piece, which was highly interactive. And, you know, all of these things were really indescribable and unforgettable. Um, Oakwe made a very beautiful piece under this um, cloak, which you can see um, is reflective and she sang. Um, and so I just wanted to include these because uh, this is also intellectual labor. Um, and, <laughs> and this we, is the image we from- We basically <laughs> look the same. <laughs> the last day we have like the same outfit on our <laughs> Uniforms, it always serves. And there's Zahara. Yeah, and there's my daughter Zahara <laughs> sitting next to Lorraine O'Grady. Um, and you can see uh, Legacy Russell next to Simone and Iris Ellis Germay, who also studied with Kamal Brathwaite. Um, and so it was really um, a historic convening over three days. And I think what made it so special, Lorraine O'Grady really talked about being able, speaking to herself, which, you know, I think is, is also um, incredible because, you know, one of the things that she said in her conversation with Simone, which was the very last conversation at Loophole, was really that we are no longer isolated um, and the fear of isolation is, is no more, um, which was, you know, for someone with a career as long as Lorraine is very significant. And she was citing loophole as the marker of the end of that isolation. And the, the first loophole at the beginning of that. And now um, with this loophole of retreat that we don't have to worry about being isolated or being alone. Um, so I'll stop there. And finally, um, you know, we wanted to talk about the crisis of cultural criticism um, because I think similar to Simone speaking about the, you know, interdependence of black women's theory um, and scholarship with art practices, um, the cultural critic is another interlocutor with artists. And I think, um, for many years, there's been um, a dearth of um, criticism, arts criticism, that can really understand the context and the content of um, black women artists. Um, and in 2019, Simone uh, was in the Whitney Biennial. Um, and it was the same year that her work was shown at the Guggenheim. And uh, Rujeku Hockley, curated um, the biennial, and it was the most, most diverse biennial in the history at that moment. Um, and there was... Of the museum. Of the, of the Whitney Museum. And there was really, um, you know, all of the scholarship that sort of came out and could not contend with the content. And, you know, we're saying things like, oh, I don't see any radical practices happening here. And Simone mm -hmm. responded, um, in an incredible way. Is it okay if I read your response? Oh my God, you didn't say you were gonna do that. <laughs> do you want to? You can also just talk about it. Maybe just read it, and then I don't have okay. any <laughs> Simone said, I've seen some preliminary thoughts on the biennial and concerns about radicality. I need to say that if you haven't read not a single thing written by Sadia Hartman or Hortense Spillers, and if you have no knowledge, never heard of negritude or how it's related to surrealism, if you don't know who Senghor is or why he would have anything to do with art, if you never spent any time figuring out who was and wasn't at Festac 77, if you have no idea what critical fabulation is, if you didn't know what I meant when I said in the wake, 
if you never studied independence architecture, if you don't know why Pauline Lumumba walked through the streets of Kinshasa bare-breasted, if you have no idea who Catherine Dunham is or her scholarship, but yet you consider yourself well-versed in the work and contributions of the women she hired as a secretary, Maya Duran, if the words black feminist thought bring absolutely zero concepts to mind, if the words Dave the Potter mean nothing to you, if you didn't ponder the significance of Sharifa's unruly kitchen when she embodied Uhura in my video, and you don't even know what a kitchen is, if the words Dogon statuary conjures nothing, if the only thing you know about Benin bronzes is that Europe stole them, if you casually use words like ethnic, exotic, and tribal, and you still think those are useful words, if you don't know what story I'm referring to when I talk about a question of power, if you thought I was being weird when I told you I was too busy sharpening my oyster knife, <laughs> if you never heard of the Herrero genocide, then you lack the knowledge to recognize the radical gestures in my work. And that is why, instead of mentioning these things, I have politely said, black women are my primary audience. Mm. Well, I, all I can say, I was, I was really, well, uh, coming out, make, you know, critiquing the Whitney Biennial is something of a sport, um, and people like to come out with the idea first, and I knew this might take off, so I was really irritated um, at this kind of attack on artists of color. Um, and I guess the only other thing I would say, and I've been feeling this um, several times, which is very unusual for someone who, as Rashida knows, is a very non-religious person. I mean, I do have a <laughs> spiritual life. But sometimes I do think I'm channeling. And this was a time where I felt like I was doing that. And also does happen when I'm making sculptures sometimes. So many things fall into place. Um, so that's maybe what was happening in that moment. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Did you want to open? Do you want to open it up? Yeah, I think we'll first do. Who like to? So we wanted to um, open it up to the audience if people have questions or contributions, and I think there will be microphones that are moving around. Is there someone in the back here? I don't know how much time we Hi. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Um, this is for Simone. Simone. I just want to know, did you design your dress? Um, <laughs> I didn't design my dress. Uh, a lot of the dresses that uh, maybe at least 50% of the dresses I wear are from Casey Casey in Paris. And she uses old um, French work costumes like from the 1800s. Hi. There's someone in the middle here. Okay. Thank you. I'll stand up. Hi, I'm Nicole, and it's crazy because I was at the new museum for the black um, black women artists for BL. Aww. I was also at the at um, the kitchen. I didn't know, I'm thinking, I'm like, I didn't really know it was you. I was following the energy of your work. And I also oh. was in Venice, but I knew that by the time I got to Venice last year, I knew <laughs> um, But just to be, um, I guess, uh, like, I'm almost like a Beyonce fan for you in a way, but not really, not really for you and not to take anything, but your work. And I say that because your work is so important when you say you're centering black women, so many organizations, so many companies, so many conglomerates center black women, and it does not have the same impact as you centering. You do more than centering. You're a healer. I know you're saying you're not religious, and I'm going to ask a question, but I just want you to know that every time you said, even tonight, I cast, I cast, to my non-artist ears, I hear cast spells. You are a um, spiritualist, a conjurer, and I appreciate you for that. <clears throat> um, I wanted to say when I looked upstairs and even in Venice, 
you have, and even how you dress, and your, I think your boots like gold, you have such a, um, a, a directive around beauty. And I wanted to ask, how do you see beauty and how do you use beauty um, as a portal to do what you do? That's the first part. And the second thing I want to say is, I was also at Weeksville, which is crazy. Wow. So I work in reproductive health care. Like this weekend, tomorrow, there's black women from all over the country, black women nurses, doulas, and midwifery. We're coming together because it is the beginning of Black Maternal Health Week, and the disparities in this country are awful. So we're gathering here in Boston. So when you're wow. doing that, I just think, again, conjuring, you're casting, right? Um, so I, I wanted to, my second part of my question was like, how did you even, how, how does health and, and black women's health even center into your work? And does it still find a way, do you see it centering in your work today? Sorry for being so. <laughs> um, well, in a really uh, personal way, the, the day before I was to leave for Venice, my father died. Um, so, and I didn't really, wasn't able to discuss it publicly, so I did a lot of private mourning, like through that installation. Um, and, you know, since he was a very, you know, basically a fundamentalist missionary, he had a very complex relationship, it was difficult. So I decided to take what I called the year off. I mean, obviously I did this show, it wasn't completely off. But I did a lot of traveling, and um, I take a lot of care of myself. And like, um, you know, I think in the last couple of years, uh, I've decided to practice what I preach. That's my focus right now, and trying to become healthier. And also, because my daughter is 27, I'm really aware of um, giving her the example of, of how to live a life well. Um, so that's been my focus right now, self-care. Good evening. I'm Michelle Lanier. It's been my honor to be in, in both of your presences. And I want to just do some ancestral worship right now and say that when you, when you hold high the phrase loophole of retreat um, and you say these words that were birthed by our, one of my guiding stars, Harriet Ann Jacobs, who's buried just eight miles from here. Mm. Um, the power that that has, it's a force like a satellite that has really emanated from Edenton, like, like your beautiful satellite sculpture, and it's beckoning so much energy. I want to thank you again for that. Um, I also just want to ask, as you contend with what I call the horrors and hallelujahs of, of the Black Atlantic, particularly through the bodies of women and femmes, um, could you talk to us a little bit about your practice of like that pivot of going into the depths of that, um, the most intense moments, but then somehow emerging <coughs> with, a, with a power that is transformative? And I just, again, want to thank you. Um, hold on a second. I would say that um, I'm really aware that I'm in this position because um, 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 hundreds of um, people have worked to get me here, especially black women, and I'm really aware of that, um, especially Rashida. Um, I wouldn't have a career if it wasn't for Rashida. Um, and I also know um, that, you know, the women in the generation older than me, even 15 years older than me, they got nothing, like absolutely nothing, and worked their entire lives, and even actually engaged in acts of protest, like you see Faith Ringgold, like outside the MoMA, um, and so uh, I feel really lucky and, um, and happy to be able to do this work, but I'm really aware, um, and it's very sobering to know um, all the people who got me here that weren't able to um, show their work on a world stage. So, um, 
that's what I would say to that. Um, I'll, I'll respond because I think when you talked about the horrors and the hallelujahs, I feel like that was sort of the, um, the two perspectives of that Tate performance, um, which was really difficult. And I somehow didn't know the history of the Tate family being involved with sugar um, mm. and slavery. Uh, but I knew when I stepped in there and tried to sing songs, <laughs> yeah. my body knew. Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, your question just about, there was a question about beauty, um, but I think, uh, you know, the beauty is like hard won, I'll say, uh, because it comes from having endured so many things. And, you know, as Simone says, the hyper awareness of, the people that make what we do possible, the people that have made it possible through their work, whether it's Harriet Jacobs or Nancy Elizabeth Prophet, um, or you know all of the names that we called um, in the UK, or all of the women who are now in these shows and museums that are doing recovery shows, right? The shows they should have done 30 and 40 years ago that they're doing now to say, oh, we need to course correct. And so what is really important to me about what Simone does and what Loophole of Retreat does is really creating that platform now rather than lamenting that it doesn't exist. So. Mm -hmm. Last question. Thank you both for this. Um, my question is maybe a bit about method and for both your shared practices, I'm curious about um, your engagement with archival photographs and your retouching of um, images that showcase the history that hurts and what these photographs in the studio, um, in your research, what memories they allow you to access. You want me to go first? Or? Um, so uh, upstairs, um, there's a there's there's several sculptures that um, began as pho photography. Um, there's a sculpture called Anonymous that uh, reproduces a, a very racist image um, from the early 20th century. It's also one of the most the most significant part of the um, photograph is that it's the first uh, image of a face jug. And we know where the face jug came from, which was the Edgefield Potters, who have a show at the MFA Boston right across the way. And um, there's a very beautiful, it's also a pretty beautiful photograph. And uh, so uh, while well, trying to make a sculpture um, from the image of this woman, I got very uncomfortable. And um, in a way that I hadn't really before, because I have dealt with racist tropes like watermelon, et cetera. Um, but there's, there, it did not, there's something that wasn't quite right. And I remembered that um, while following Madeline around Martinique, who was working on her, um, uh, I guess feature film is opening at the Perez next week on Suzanne Césaire. She was um, scouting for locations and we just happened to be there uh, during the time of Carnival. And the tradition um, in Martinique is that um, the community will take an idea or an object or even sometimes um, a person, something that the community needs to get rid of and make an effigy of that, really a large scale one, and take it to the river and burn it, uh, to the water and burn it. And so we happened to be there. This year they chose uh, the Vival, um, this is what the object that we burn is called, was chlorodicone, which is a chemical that has contaminated the entire island whilst it was banned in the United States in the 60s, it continued to be used in Martinique uh, for over 20 years, so everyone on the island is contaminated with this island, and so um, they have decided to make the Vival this year, Chlordicone, and I knew about that because Vanessa Agar Jones had done her PhD on Chlordicone and gender and sexuality in Martinique. 
Um, so this is what I mean where sometimes I feel like I'm channeling. Um, and so Madeline and I were making a film as I was making the sculpture um, that reproduced the racist image. Um, and I was uncomfortable with it. So uh, we made a paper effigy of this woman and took it out to the water in Red Hook and burned it, which is what you see in the video. Um, and right now, I feel like that in this whole conversation about monuments and what we might, I think that, you know, this, you know, ritual from the Caribbean is really uh, offering an idea of the way we could think about monument making, which is the community getting rid of something. Um, so that, those are some of the ways I've been dealing with photography. I don't work with photography in a direct way, so I'll let Simone in there, other than you know, images of Catherine Dunham and Zora Neale Hurston um, in their work as participant observer, which I also work with um, in my choreography, um, and you know, and also the early films that Zora Neale Hurston made. So I think that was the last question. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Simone. <laughs>